All right. All right. Listen, fellas, we are going to get ready to get started. And uh, first thing we're going to do is go around and introduce ourselves. Uh, give, give us your name, city you're in, and uh, briefly, one way that this is impacting you. So uh, my name is Bill Buffington uh, from Inglewood, California. Uh, definitely one way that all the things that are happening in the world right now in regards to uh, just the murder and uh, the rioting and all these things is I'm having conversations with white brothers and I'm having conversations with black brothers that are impacted in different ways. And I'm challenged right now to, to keep the gospel central in my responses and even in my own heart and attitude. So um, those are things I'm having to think through as a result of this right now. Pass the rock. Travis. So I'm um, Travis Burbanks. I'm out here in um, Tarzana, California. And the impact that all of this is going on that has on me is um, it just is first is real heavy on my heart to see uh, what's going on in, in, in the black community and in the community in general. And um, the impact is, I mean, it's really heavy as far as just what's going on. It could be me. And that's um, hard for me when I go outside and uh, wondering like, oh, would I be the next one? Or would my mom or my, um, you know, my family mourn over my death and people start protesting and um, because it's, it's my life. So uh, I'm living it. And, and that's why it's so impactful what's going on. And it's just, Hit me with that super hard. Uh, my name is William Fair. I'm here in uh, Holly Springs, North Carolina, which is near the Raleigh area. Um, the way that this is impacting me is that is very reminiscent of some of the things that I experienced when living in Los Angeles, whether that's with the Rodney King riots or with uh, some of the other things that we've seen over time. Um, uh, just like my brother Bill has said, he's uh, being impacted by different people asking different questions. Uh, like him is with believers, non-believers alike, as well as uh, of all different races. And I feel like it's given us an opportunity to really discuss the gospel and give us an opportunity to really talk about the answers that uh, lie uh, at the very core of what, where the problem actually begins. Yeah. My name is Aaron Stevens. I'm in uh, Riverside, California. and. Uh, uh, the way that this situation and uh, everything has been impacting me is really just causing me to think about um, where we are at as a, as a community and uh, where we want to get to and how, how I can play a part in that. And uh, just like the other brothers have shared, having, having conversations and uh, people being honest uh, and open uh, has, has at least allowed me to see a, a beginning of something that could, could be good. My name is Ian. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> My name is Ian Thompson. I'm from Riverside, California. Currently, I'm in Atlanta. Um, the way this has impacted me is just um, that this was a, you know, a, a tragic experience that no one should see, and I just happen to be a part of the community that is most affected by this. And I've watched tears, I've watched pain, I've shed tears and so many memories of what's happened to my people as black people. So many re reminders of the things that we have gone through are brought up and it brings pain. And, you know, it's affected me also by making me have to really wonder how is my experience in this atmosphere going to be in the future. My name is Dion Webb. I am from Los Angeles, California, Watts to be exact. But, you know, currently reside in Paris, California. I've been bouncing around, but that's another story. So um, I feel like I'm affected by this in a sense. Uh, I feel sometimes, most of the times, to be honest with you, I'm, I feel numb. Because coming from where I grew up with, uh, coming from where I come from, the area I grew up in, seeing my my fathers, my uncles mistreated by the police has really uh, 
really affected me. So I feel like what we're going through today is nothing new. I really, to quite honestly, don't know how to approach this with, with other people because maybe I'm just pushing it in the back of my mind because it's, it's just like repetitive to me. But um, what I'm looking to, to see that, to happen not only within myself, but within the culture is definitely a change and a, a better response. I'm also looking to, to, to step up on my end to share how I can enc encourage not only brothers and sisters in the church, but other races, other, uh, other platforms that may want to be educated on, on this whole subject matter. So uh, that's just a little bit about me. Yeah, my name is Aldre Chislam, and I am originally from uh, Riverside, California, but I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota right now. The way that this is affecting me, um, the fact that I have a white wife in a state that is not um, that is not very accepting to interracial relationships, um, as well as having a son who's interracial, and um, it's impacting our family and where we can get groceries from. It's impacting our family in the way that um, we have to move, <laughs> what time we have to be inside. Um, there's, there, yeah, there's just, a, there's just a lot of ways this is in, impacting us, especially as an African-American male. I feel that um, this is something that is, is, is very traumatic because of it. it's constantly, these type of killings are constantly posted on the media all the time, which can really um, jab at the value um, as an African American man and woman, it can jab at our value and our identity. Um, and, and for me, it kind of makes us as a people, for me, feel like, what can I do hopeless? So that's how it's affected me. Uh, my name is Josh Thompson. Um, I currently reside in uh, Woodland Hills, uh, Los Angeles. And we got a church in Studio City. Um, and uh, it is probably. Uh, most affected me um, and my wife, Katie, and our little baby. Um, it's brought, I mean, sadness. Uh, it's brought fear. Um, a lot of emotions uh, even run through our family as we see the city falling apart and our nation falling apart. And I think the thing that's what's affected me the most is the divide amongst people and to see uh, the lack of understanding and the in the church, a lack of understanding amongst brothers, um, amongst sisters, amongst uh, family members and friends. It just, social media is just blowing up. Everybody's fighting each other, and it's like it's a mess, you know. So that that's probably the most disheartening thing. It's sad. Um, and when we were trying to come together um, against this injustice, and now it, everything's it's just been crazy, you know. So. Um, we're, I mean, that's what I'm excited about, just being able to come together with the brothers and have a real conversation about these things. Yeah. Um, so, Bill, I was thinking maybe we should pray. Huh? You want to pray for us and maybe everybody listening? I thought that'd be helpful. Yep. Father, we just come before you right now, and uh, we pray you would go before us in this uh, this conversation that we're going to have. Uh, Lord, you know all that's going on in our world, uh, how so many of these things are hot topics and heated, uh, hotly debated issues, uh, even among believers. God, I pray you would fill us with your spirit, that you would inspire our thoughts, and as we flesh out and share uh, our experiences, how we view these things, how we've been impacted, uh, God, I also pray you would, you would by your spirit, through your word, according to your truth, uh, you would provide answers that are, that are meaningful and beneficial and helpful, uh, things that we can, we can hang our, our, uh, our anchors from, Lord. And so uh, go before us, Father. Lead us in our time of speaking now. Uh, help us to say things that will be helpful, edifying, and would point people to you as a result. Uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, everybody tuning in. Um, this this kind of came from um, me and reaching out to the brothers um, that I've just been in contact with for a long time. Um, and 
I think a lot of people subliminally like want these kind of conversations to happen, but like nobody really does it. And um, this, this group of guys, all these guys on the screen, I love these guys. They all love the Lord. They all know the word of God. And we've been, we've been, we've been running together for a long time. And so there's a, there's a, our hearts are knit together. And I love that we've been able to have lots of conversations behind closed doors about all kinds of things. And um, we're still brothers and we have disagreed on things and we've, um, we, we've agreed on obviously tons of things, but we keep running together and, you know, people tuning in, like you're going to disagree with some of the things that are said and, and there, there may be some things that are real direct and you just don't like it. Don't tune out, you know, like watch the whole thing, like understand a uh, context and like what, what the big picture is. And, um, this is going to be, this is raw and real. Um, this is just like us uh, talking, like we've always talked and I love the conversations that happen with the brothers. They're some of my favorite times, uh, because we get to sharpen and build up and encourage each other and, challenge each other and they're good conversations and a lot of people don't get to see these none of this is it's not rehearsed we uh we talk through some of the questions before just to get an idea where we're going but none of this is rehearsed we don't have written down answers we're we're just going for it so this is a real conversation and um i've asked bill buffington uh to step in bill buffington's lead pastor calvary chapel inglewood and just a good brother and um co-worker in the gospel here in LA and um, just thankful for him. And so we just asked him to, we're kind of going to just walk through this together um, and work through questions and just, you know, have some dialogue. So um, I'm hoping this is really edifying. Yep. So come along with us. Um, I think a, a good place to start you guys is obviously, and just for those that are listening, you know, and in, in the recent months uh, there've been just, you know, major events that have happened that have really impacted those of the black community and other communities. We have uh, George Floyd, who uh, that's the most recent one. And everybody's seen the video and we've watched this man plead for his life and die as a police officer knelt on his neck. Um, and he died from the injuries of it. And um, as you're looking at the screen, these are black men, these are black faces um, impacted. Um, I got black sons, you know, these are, these are scary times. Um, before that we had a mod Mulberry who was running and was shot and killed and, um, and it was on video and that was put up and, um, and there's a myriad of, you know, we could, we could go all day, but there's a myriad of, of videos that we see as black people of police officers and just other people in the community taking our lives. And it doesn't seem to have the value that, it should have. Our lives don't seem to be valued at the same rate as other citizens. And so we're, we're here as believers wanting to discuss it, um, how this impacts us. Uh, the first question I want to put out to all of us here, um, as again, there's the Black communities outraged. There are other people that are not Black that are just as outraged as they watch the video as well. But um, the question I would put out first, and anybody wants to take it can take it, is how is the gospel? How is how was our knowledge of the gospel impact how we, how we manage our feelings, um, how we handle these things that are taking place in our community right now? How does the gospel impact how we view this, how we see this, what we do about it? Uh, throw that out there. Anybody want to take it? I guess I'll kick it off then. So, you know, it's wonderful to have an objective view about the things that are going on in your life things that are going on around you. You don't put yourself inside of a box and just say, this is my life and this is what's going on with me. But with an objective view, you can see all things that are going on and try to see it from a perspective that is greater than yourself. So for me, the gospel has been that very, that very lens that I've looked through, that uh, in spite of my anger, my disappointment, and a myriad of, uh, which is a word we've, we're gonna probably use a lot here, um, the myriad amount of um, emotions that are running through me, I still come back to the center of everything, the center of my life, and that is Christ Jesus on the cross, um, dying for my sins, dying for the sins of even those who are out there doing unspeakable things, um, whether it's uh, the injustice that's been 
placed on this young man who's lost his life, or even those who are out there uh, rioting, uh, which is just as much injustice towards those who they uh, make their victim. And I would, I would just piggyback on that. Just, um, I, I feel like the gospel, <clears throat> when I guess without the gospel, I just would be angry and feel like I, I got to do something. You know, the gospel reminds me that God did something, you know, um, that we're not going to exact justice uh, in this world. That I don't, I don't believe that we'll ever have righteous government till Jesus Christ himself is ruling and reigning. So my awareness of that keeps me, you know, when I see the injustice, I'm like, yeah, that's, this is what it looks like when sinners govern sinners. And so um, terrible as it is, awful as the things that are happening are, the gospel does give me another lens that says, this, this, well, this isn't my home. This is a temporary place I'm passing through. I'm on a mission. I got to be about the business. And nobody's really getting away with anything. This thing all ends up with a final judgment and people will pay for what they've done. And the only way you escape the judgment is through Christ. And so um, so for me, when otherwise I would be angry or feel like, man, I don't know what's going on. It's like, I, I the gospel is, uh, it, I think it, it anchors me in a place sure. where, you know, this will all be, all the wrongs will be righted one day. And so um, we may or may not get to see it, but it, you know, it does settle me. I, I know that God's gonna take care of these things eventually, but but we're living here and now. And so, um, you know, uh, I mean, put this out there. Um, what are, what are you guys just, what are, what are expectations? What are we hoping for churches to do? What, what's helpful? Uh, what do you guys see? What are church, what have churches done and said that was helpful, but also to help people out, what have churches done and said that's not helpful? What have you guys experienced from the church that was either helpful or not helpful? Um, about these things. If I could, if I could say something quickly, I think one of the things that I've seen churches do um, less is address the issue of sin. I mean, I, I, the reason why I talk about specifically sin is because um, there are a lot of people with this situation who um, who don't believe that this was um, unjust, who don't believe that um, you know this was wrong. But I think we have. When, when we understand the simple nature of a human being, we understand that sin leads to death. And any man who is led or any woman who is led by sin, they are capable of committing a sin that is as deep as murder or molestate, molesting a child or whatever the case may be. Um, and so I think what, I think what this situation is, is heavy, uh, is, is, is very heavy because we see that, um, I don't, I don't see a lot of churches um, talking about it, it's it's it, it as it's as if um, the man was incapable because he was in a police uniform of being sinful, mm. and um, I think when we go to churches for churches to look at it from the biblical perspective of no one is righteous, not one, and all have fallen short of the glory of God, we can see this as simply unjust. And uh, it's not, it, 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 we can see that simply as just. And I think that um, that I feel has hurt in the, in, in the church, the, that has hurt the desire to fight something that is, un, that is something that is unjust. Because most people who are in predominantly, I'll speak for white churches, are um, maybe a lot of their family members are law enforcement, are in military. And so then they have, a, have that issue of choosing sides. Uh, well, I want to support my family, but what, what does the gospel say? And even us as black men, like, what does the gospel say for us? Should we rest in that anger, or are we to still, are we to still forgive a man that committed a heinous act, hoping that he will repent and ask for forgiveness? Um, so yeah, I think I think uh, the conversation of sin and, and what we are capable of doing in sin that no one is. Um, no one, everyone is subject to doing crazy things under sin. True, true. I think um, another thing that, like, along with Aldre saying is, is addressing it. Like, I think that is a, a helpful thing. There are a number <laughs> of churches um, that have a, a diverse population. And just because it may not be an all black church or uh, there may not be a majority of black people in the congregation, to dismiss 
um, the, the current events of the day, uh, I think is hurtful and um, it, it, it's, it's not helping. So simply just to address the issues, um, and, and I'm not saying that every, every pulpit needs to be a platform to uh, you know, come down strong with the hammer on, on social injustice, but to address the issue, to address the hurt um, that, that people are feeling, uh, to pray for that, to pray for the country, I think is, is a, at least a step in the right direction and allowing people to see like, I, I see you, like I, I, I don't dismiss the situation that's happening. And I think that can be helpful in the church. Yeah, Aaron, if I can um, like speak to that a little bit. Um, it's, a hard, it's a hard thing being a pastor and trying to navigate, you know, so that you don't, you got so many different opinions in the crowd, you know, and you're like, you're trying, you want to do um, what God would call you to do, what the word of God would call you to do, what Christ would do, and you should. And in doing so many times you offend. So I've got people, I got, I got three different uh, categories in the church. I got number one, the, the category that says, don't talk about politics. You know, you just preach the Bible and, uh, you know, keep, keep the political things out of this. Like we, we came to worship and we came to look at Christ. Like we don't want to talk about real life. Number two, uh, we have those who get angry and saying like, you're, you're supporting the race war, you know, you're, you're feeding into this by like, you know, by, by talking about this or by lifting it up, people get ticked about that. And then you have the other that who would say, you know, we're not doing enough, you know, like you, you need to speak up more, you need to uh, preach more on it and, um, or you need to talk more about it or you got to get it right and exact. And, you know, especially as a white pastor, like you're trying to figure out how do I say this? How do I handle this with care? How do I win uh, people to Christ? And how do, how do I minister to my black brothers and sisters and also the white brothers and sisters at the same time? You know, you're standing in the pulpit trying to pull this off. So, I mean, I'd love to hear you guys' perspective on that. Man, I, I, I'll jump in on that because I, I, I am a pastor as well. And, uh, you know, I, the, the, my, this is a rule, right? If, if I'm going to take a stance on something, I want to be able to say, you know, because it's written here, you know, so um, if I'm going to say, hey, the, the, the murder of this man is, is, a, is an unjust murder, you know, um, I can stand on that. This was an unjust murder. Uh, the man was accused of, of using a, a fake bill. Uh, wasn't, he wasn't charged with it. He wasn't resisting. He was already subdued. He was already handcuffed. This even goes against their own rules and policies. This was an unjust murder in the middle of the day. Um, I'm confident that I can, I can speak that um, and if someone feels a way about it or disagrees with it, I'm okay, you know, because the Bible says that, you know, sin is, you know, just it's, it's murder is a sin. So I, I, I'm confident I can, I can speak that, you know, um, if I'm telling, I'm speaking to black people primarily and that are angry and that are upset. And um, so for me, it's not trying to educate a white person and say, hey, we need to be sympathetic. I'm talking to people on this side that it's like, you know, sin is not good. We're not going to fix sin with sin. We're not going to, we're not going to, you know, we're not, we're not going to march this out. You know, you're not going to vote this out. You're not going to, I think we live in a world that gives people all sorts of things to hope in that falls short of the truth. And so I try to keep bringing them back to the gospel, you know, that um, our only hope is the gospel. You know, these are sin issues that begin in the heart of men. And, you know, if, if we, if we fixed the whole world and flipped it around where black people were in power and white people were not, we would just be the, we would be the ones that were, you know, whoever's in power is going to be the oppressor. We'd be oppressing the white man. They'd be, they'd be praying for God to deliver them, you know, from us. Um, I think just when you put sinners over other sinners, we end up with a world like this. And the only answer is really that God pluck out believers, mm. that there be that remnant of people that come to Christ in the midst of it. So um josh i would just say bro we got to keep preaching the gospel we gotta we gotta bring every situation and just sift it through the gospel and and just feed the people that you know we're angry this is what the gospel says you could do with your anger there's injustice this is what jesus did about injustice Thanks. you know there's police brutality. jesus endured police brutality you know and then he forgave them he said father forgive them because they don't know what they're doing i think we have to just do that and and, and I'm telling you that I'm doing that and there are people that don't like it. No, we want something, they want something else. Mm. Um, but I can't provide you anything else. If, if the gospel's not good enough, then I don't have anything for you. Mm -hmm. I can't hey. help 
I don't have another, I don't have another message and there's not another truth. And so I'll, I'll sit on that. And if you leave, if you disagree, if you get mad, I got to eat that, but I, I, I'll stand on, I'll stand on that truth all the way. So. Well, and, and I think, yeah. I, I think the, just, just to be uh, a sense of opposition here, I think the opposite side of that is the one is the uh, pastor or the preacher who's uh, apathetic to the situation, where they're not taking any stance whatsoever, that they err on the side of not even allow that to be filtered through the gospel, you know, and I think that we, uh, we end up in a situation there that we're like uh, King Saul's armor bearer where uh, he, he falls on his sword, so then I'm going to fall on the sword too. No, we need to say something, be there, even if it's from a gospel perspective, to uh, bring up the, the need to intensify hope in the people that we, that we minister to on a regular basis. We need to give them that hope and understanding that, number one, God is still present. Then number two, th there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, what was the problem with the last time we dealt with this? How do we deal with it right now? How did they deal with these things in the Bible? And Bill, I think you even put that on the point where Jesus forgave those who policed over him and crucified him. And uh, we also in the same position have to trust in the God that is in this world and has never left this world. Exactly. Facts. And I'm just kind of piggybacking off of all three of you gentlemen, um, you know, just from the perspective of being a believer that's sitting in the pew, that goes to a predominantly white church. Um, you know, we have to take a look at, like you said, Will and, and Bill, um, how, did, how, how are these things addressed biblically? You look at it in a book of Galatians where we all know the story where Peter get, goes to Antioch and he's sitting with the uh, Gentiles, right? And then James and his boys come in or his people come in and, and you, now, oh, I don't want to sit with the Gentiles. I'm sitting with the Jews. So like, Paul's like, hold on, brother. This ain't, this ain't what this is about. Right. So we have classism and racism that's evident in the Bible. It might not be black on black or black on white, but you see it in a, in a perspective biblically. And how was it handled? It was, it was, it was dealt with Paul saying, look, you got to repent from that brother. Cause this is not, this is not what our ministry is for. And I, and I, and I like how you, you just, you hit it on the, you know, on the head when you said, Bill, that if it ain't the gospel, I ain't got nothing else for you. So there's the door. Yeah. But we have to address this situation, whether I'm white, black, purple, pink, whatever it is, injustice is injustice. And how yeah. we handling it is how the Bible tells us to handle it. And so I don't care about the money that you give to the church. I don't care if your feelings get hurt, but we have to address this. And we're going to do this biblically. And yeah, if people yeah. can't understand that, then, hey, what can you do about that? But pray for them, you know? So I feel like two cents. the hard thing is, like, as a person sitting in the pew, a Black person, and, and knowing that all these things are going on and to not hear anything be addressed, um, it's it's hurtful at the end of the day. Like, because yeah. I can sit on another Sunday, on National Sanctity of Life Sunday, and hear uh, issues that are controversial, abortion, um, be spoken about and rallied against and and funds being raised for um or or uh, any other any other hot button christian topic uh, homosexuality uh, same-sex marriage these other things are, are are controversial issues in our culture um but but the church doesn't seem to have a um, and i say church generally and, and i don't mean to say every single church but typically um there's uh, a, an ease of, of navigating those conversations and those topics from a platform. Um, but then when it comes to situations like what we're experiencing today, it's like, well, I don't know if I can, uh, the, at least in my mind, the, uh, the the attitude that I see of the church is like, I don't know if this is, is kosher enough for us to navigate. I don't know if I can do it. And it's like, well, why are all these other issues, but the issues that are, are relevant to me, um, I don't know, just, it, it can it can come across as, as hurtful. Um, we can take this even in history. Um, we looked at how the Bible was used in slavery days to continue to oppress, um, to continue to oppress. And you look at today, sometimes you question, it seems like it's still in the DNA of a lot of these churches that a lot of times me and Ian was talking about this, uh, not too long ago 
when you don't push a lot of times you allow people to lead you allow minorities to lead and i'm specifically talking about black people you, you allow them to lead in particular areas but you won't give them that step you won't you won't put them in that position of leading um a magnitude of people and sometimes when you do that it kind of shows an african-american their place within the church and and that has been my experience when i first came to christ um i attended a majority white church and although i had african-american brothers around me and brothers that i believed who truly loved me as a brother in christ the fact that i'd never seen anybody in african-american leadership it it installed in me a belief that black churches had false theology that no that that every white person that i seen was saved and this was this was this was literally installed into my heart into my mind and i believe that in order for me to truly have salvation i had to completely strip everything from me and my culture and take on the predominant european american culture to be saved and i feel when you don't address the issues that come from our community but yet you want um you want to have a church in our community it, it's it, it's really offensive and it's really heartbreaking because now i don't have anybody to look to as a godly man in a sense for my culture and i'm stripping myself and abandoning my culture because i believe that this is the way and that has been my experience and i've talked to many brothers and maybe some of the brothers on here can touch on that but that was a big issue when i first came to the lord and still to this day it affects me where i or really step into an african-american church because it's installed in me to believe that they don't have solid theology that they don't have the right teaching that the way and style maybe their um voice is louder or the music they have is not holy and not godly the worship that they have is not holy and godly and this is something that has been embedded in the minds of, of, of a, i'm going to say it that white culture is holy and dominant and that is the only way that we can obtain salvation is if we this is not everybody but from my experience and people that i've talked to that in order for us to obtain salvation we must submit ourselves under the rule and transform from our cultural ways to their cultural ways to be met to meet christ um so yeah well, i i you know i'll just uh i'll just say this um compared to yesteryear whatever years it may have been in the past we're in a different culture now it, the community is not the same way way it used to be. It's not nearly as segregated as it used to be. Um, you have a, more of a mixture of people in different environments now. So when you talk about a particular church that's either predominantly white or predominantly black, a lot of that is based on choice of cultural uh, 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 desire, I would have to say. So if I see a hundred people inside of a church and 12 of them have to happen to be black African-American that believe it or not is somewhat of a representation of society in America. We make up only 12% of the population, which is a significant size of the population, but we have to realize that we are a culture that melts together. Now, even when we talk about this injustice that we're talking about today, with the rioting and everything that's going on, we're seeing a situation that probably rivals that of, um, of South Africa and, um, and everything that they dealt with. It literally went global. All of the protests was not just here in the United States, not just on this partic particular continent, but it seemed to stretch over into Europe and other places as well. That's because the injustice itself is is um, is worldwide as well. It goes back to something that Bill even said. We're in a fallen world, and we got to bring the light to the world. We have to expose the injustice in order to bring about a change within the system itself to remove the injustice. If we don't do that, if we don't put ourselves in that position, whether it's being apathetic from the pulpit or whether it's uh, the injustices that have been perpetuated inside of the church by not seeing enough of African American in certain positions, um, whatever the case may be, um, we have to shine the light to those particular areas, especially when we know that, and we all know this as men of God, God is gonna tell you when there's an injustice. He's gonna put it on your heart. 
And it, the reason he's putting on, on your heart is because there's an expectation that you need to step up to that particular charge. And I, 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 I most definitely appreciate that, but I do believe that if a church plants itself in a minority community, then they have an obligation to serve that community. Um, and whether it is placing people in that community who understand the community in position to better serve, to grow their church, because in the kingdom of God, we're, go we're going to see diversity, true or false. We're gonna see no, you're absolutely on. You're right. You're 100% right. Any church that's in any community must serve that community. Mm -hmm. And literally, that's where the change starts. Mm. It starts on a one-on-one -on -one yeah. relational basis. And that's yeah. where the church has to be. We need to be knocking on the doors and talking to the people that even live around the church or are engaged in the church and talking about these things. And I think that when you become a church that handles those difficulties that Aaron was talking about earlier, whether it be homosexuality or any other injustice that we feel exists or divisive things that are out there, then mm -hmm. you will be become probably one of the most popular churches in the city because people are looking for truth. They're looking for things to understand themselves and understand the society around them better. That would right. I would add to, Dre, I think what um, you're speaking to is, and maybe to bring some clarity, that you would, it, it's, it, first off, if you're, if you're in a place of diversity, the church has got to reflect what's going on in that area, no doubt. Like, the church should represent that. But at the same time, you're, I don't, you're not saying that because it, I think some of the white culture might be hearing that, that um, we should just put people of color in position um, regardless of, you know, who they are as a person or faithfulness to the church or meeting the qualifications of the Bible. Because yeah. sometimes churches do that. They're just like, oh, dang, we got to look like, you know, we have equality here. So let me just, yeah, that's to, true. you know, let, let, me, mm -hmm. let me build a, an image that we're interracial, you know, and that we, we love all people. And, and, and it's, it's, um, now, now, when you have brothers who are clearly meeting qualifications, are clearly walking with the Lord and faithful and have been faithful, and then they're kind of getting pushed to the back, and you got all these yes. guys being put in business, like, yes. what, what's of course. The, you know, that that's not right. And I just wanted to make sure that was, yeah. That's, I, that's, I, exactly, I that's exactly what we were saying. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for clarifying that, because that's, I think I speak from that experience, but I also appreciate uh, I also pr appreciate the other perspective as well. So thank you, Will, for sharing that too. I think this is a good, uh, good conversation. And I just want to add on to that, that um, just to expose kind of what I've seen in the background with the church experience, specifically with minority people, me being a black man, I feel like just to add in, I've seen a church move into a community and it's a diverse community, but yet they bring a monoculture community. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole way that the church operates is monoculture based mm -hmm. upon mm -hmm. primarily what the pastor is, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's insensitive to, you know, being a place that makes a home for everyone, you know? And what that does, it makes a person who is different come there and go man this isn't a comfortable place and they don't come and i know specifically for the black community that that's a, one of the biggest challenges and to add into what dre was saying he's touching on a very important point not only is there a spiritual implication by this unwelcomed environment but there is even just a moral implication because that minority who comes to that monoculture church and commonly it's a white church, culture church they have a pressure like anybody would have to fit in to be accepted so mm -hmm. what i've seen happen and i felt the pressure to go wow well i must need to change who i am like dre mentioned i must need to strip my culture so mm -hmm. i can fit in and mm -hmm. that's a psych i mean that that affects so much your heart mind so many things and and then even that most of the times concludes that person still not having an equal playing field of opportunity to yeah. even be a ministry in that church. So you yeah. see 
it can flow so deep. And I'm just saying this to expose what I've seen. Right. Yeah, and then so and then at the end of the day, like, how can you relate to the the George Floyd, to the Philando Castillo for all these different African Americans? Because it's gonna pop up, right? It's gonna pop up that all these African Americans are getting killed and it's an uprising. But I look at my church and we're in a community where it's diverse, diverse culture. But I look at my staff and I got one black guy or, and, and one Mexican on the staff and the rest is, is, is Caucasian. But let me speak on a topic. So now you got people in the pew who are of different ethnicities, Asians, black, you know, whatever it may be. And they're saying, well, how can you be qualified when I'm looking around and I don't really see multiculture. So then I think that from just from the outside looking in, that puts a pastor in perspective, like, oh, snaps, like, yeah, okay, maybe I should touch on it. Or, you know, it won't, it won't allow a pastor to be so uncomfortable. To, and this is just my point of view. It won't allow, allow that pastor to be so uncomfortable addressing situations like this. Because if you got a, a situation that we're experiencing nowadays, and you got a a, a congregation that's just all Caucasian and maybe a white guy, I mean, a, a African-American or a Asian here or a Hispanic there, you know, how can they really address it with authority and what power, you know? So that's just my, my view. Before we, uh, we're going to, we're going to move. We got, we got the other topics we want to touch on, but I'll, I'll just say this to, <laughs> cause that's a lot. It's a lot there. We could, we could probably spend the rest of the night on that, you know? So, um, <laughs> You know, suffice it to say, maybe some pastors will watch this, you know, um, you know, what's being said is, you know, one, a church should reflect the community that, that it's placed in, both in the people that attend and Lord willing, as you make disciples in the people that are raised up to serve. And, um, and, and in no way, you know, and I think as we do that, you know, we can have a healthy, a healthy dynamic. You know, I sat down um, with our team. Now, our church is you know, about 70% black and 30% of everything else, you know? Um, and, and, and we sat down with me, two white guys, a Mexican, three black guys and had this conversation, you know, um, and, and, and just share perspectives, you know, with each other. And, uh, and it was healthy, you know, it's like, um, you know, everybody has the freedom to be what they are. So, um, and I would just say to any guys here that are, that are, you know, maybe you're somewhere and you feel like, man, I don't, I don't feel like our church, you know, hears us, you know, um, it, it may be, maybe you want to speak to someone. Uh, maybe you want to go and, and share your heart respectfully, humbly, you know, don't, don't be, don't, don't be the angry black man, going, you know, going up there, yeah, yeah. up the pastor, man. But, you know, it might be helpful. Sometimes it's helpful to bring somebody on, you know, they just, mm-hmm. and I would just say this, and I'm not bashing my white brothers. Sometimes it's ignorance is bliss. Sometimes it's nice to not know. And I'm gonna give this example. We're gonna move on. I have a son with autism, right? Yeah. So I'm very aware of kids or people with disabilities yeah. and how we need to meet their needs and look out for them. I'm affected by it, so I'm aware of it. But if I be honest, before I was affected by it, I was completely unaware of it. Mm-hmm. And I was, I, was, I was in a church context, I wasn't thinking, what do we do for the kids with special needs? It was never a thought in my mind. But when I was impacted by it, it's like, wow, man, I, I'm... I'm I'm aware of something that I was ignorant of, you know, before. And sometimes, you know, mercy and grace to the, the guys that are there in that position, they, they may need a brother or someone in the body to come and lovingly say, hey, brother, this is a blind spot you got. And if you're willing to hear me out, let me share this with you. It, it'll really help the body, man. There are people out there that are, they're dying to hear you say something, man. You ain't said nothing. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and that way we maybe can become part of the solution in our local church rather than, you know, aware that something's missing and mad about it, you know, that's, that's something we could do that may, we may help out somebody and it may help out the whole church. So, um, so yeah, please. Um, like one thing I would say is, is if you are in a, uh, a church where you are not the majority, um, at the same time, as much as it, as it can be more welcoming to experience a different environment, um, don't allow that to be a hindrance to your walk and how deep you would dive into the scriptures for yourself. Like, yes. Like, Amen. Come up from a pulpit that, that could look like you and, and give you aspirations of, of things that you would maybe like to pursue in your own life. But 
at the end of the day, you have to stand before God as a human being. And if the mm. word of God is being taught, allow that to penetrate your soul. And, uh, and, and there is, there's, there's things that need to get worked out in our own hearts, uh, regardless yes. of race and, and what we may see. And yep. I would encourage you not to allow, um, uh, the color of a person's skin or the, the demographic of your congregation to prevent you from seeking out discipleship. Uh, mm -hmm. I've seen great relationships and discipleship take place. I've seen pastors of great churches who look nothing like the congregation, um, but because they care and they're compassionate and they uh, have invested into those people, uh, they are extremely effective. And, and so we're not saying that it, it has to be uh, black people in the pulpit or on staff in order for black people to feel accommodated or welcome to the church what we're saying at least what i would say is um be aware of the people in the congregation yeah. and and open themselves up to them uh but also for the congregant to not allow those those barriers to to prevent you from diving deep into your own personal relationship with the lord mm -hmm. yeah. i can i can oh, um oh go ahead trav i was gonna give 30 oh, I can. no trav go ahead no this is really quick um just even like what aaron said um because that's it a perfect example of what I experienced uh, coming from a all black church. Uh, I think I talked to one of the brothers and I've never seen an all white church. So I never knew how to even talk to somebody that was even white about God or period. I mean, that, that's just me growing up. I'm from the mm -hmm. South. I'm from Tennessee. I, I mean, we looked at the white churches in the South, like it was something complete. Like it was a whole nother gospel over there. <laughs> and it's true and I come you know moved to California and my the first church I come to is a predominantly all-white church and seeing that you know I think it's, it's even part of my testimony uh, also of my, with my walk and it opened my eyes to because I was it was hindering my walk like I said it was hindering my walk I did not want it I was literally just sitting at home watching online service which we're doing it now because of COVID-19 but I was just doing that when the church is right down the street, a Bible teaching church. And I'd rather sit online and miss out on what God had for my life mm. because I wanted to only see black, a black church. And I didn't want to understand a white church. Mm. So that, you know, that's huge. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I was just going to add, Bill, that to all the white pastors watching, um, you know, I had a buddy ask me, like, how do you, he basically, I'll just tell you, he said, how do you get black guys to be serving at your church? Like, what does that look like? I was like, dude, number yeah, one, like, you, you, <laughs> number one, I said, you can be intentional with all people and anybody who comes into the church. <laughs> so I just said, you know, when I see somebody come through the doors and I can tell they feel uncomfortable because oh, they're Filipino, they just, they just got here to America or if they're black or if they're whatever, they feel awkward. I, I'm a hugger. So I walk up and I hug people and, um, and I, it's my way, it's my way of letting them know, please stay like, you're welcome here. I'm happy you're here. Like be a part of what's going on and then try to encourage them to get involved, chop it up with them, like talk with them and spend time. And so if I see somebody that feels awkward or looks different than me, generally I'll go, go up to them and try to spend more time with them to help them to feel comfortable. And that's what I attempt to do. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of times pastors don't know what to do. They're literally just sitting there mm. like, how do I get a diverse, like, you know, community? I don't know what to do. You know, I don't know. So... Mm. I um, want to share. Let me let me share a quote with you guys, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, it was Mahatma Gandhi that said this. He said, "I am a much misrepresented man if I am also a somewhat esteemed man." In other words, he felt himself never to be esteemed, not even somewhat esteemed. Mm. He saw himself to be one that would be a servant. Mm. one who would serve others and it's the same situation with us inside of the church if we are as a pastor or anything else like that are not of service to the ones that are uh, coming in the church then we have every right to say i don't understand why i don't have this type of person in the church or that type of person in the church in what way have you made yourself um one who would actually be a servant to those particular people <laughs> or that particular diversity. So mm -hmm. I think there's a, a need. I mean, 
when I think of churches that are in Los Angeles, because of his platform, uh, I think only um, uh, Bishop uh, over at um, Faithful Central made it a point to say, I need to open my church up to more diversity, to allow more white people to come in because I feel that my teaching and the way that I have gone about it has, has um, isolated our church and has uh, pushed those particular brothers and sisters away. So, I mean, he's the only major black church that I know that has made that particular announcement and had that realization. And I think that we at all churches need to realize um, we are servants to the entire community. Mm -hmm. Josh, like to what to your situation that you explained with you being in the foyer and welcoming people, I think it, it's it's not so much a race issue as it is just a, a ministry issue. Like you are with the people. Like mm -hmm. you are willing to go hug someone that's that's uncomfortable. There's a certain level of uncertainty. I don't know this person. I don't know what they look like, and and I feel like. A shepherd should be with the sheep, should be in the congregation. If he knows his people, they're going to love him. They'll know he knows their name. They know him. And, and that's how you can get, regardless of what race, people to be involved yeah. and committed. I mean, to see what you've done in the, the plant that you started, uh, it's because you're a shepherd. Like, and, and I think if we continue to raise up shepherds, uh, we can see churches uh, experience true relationship, true discipleship, and uh, hopefully uh, reach the communities that we're in. Facts. Facts. And I, and I kind of also, and I know we got to get going, but, you know, that's one thing I've seen in you, Josh. That's what kind of made me stay around the church that I am because of that welcoming spirit. And if we look yes, at, sir. you know, if we look at the book of Timothy, if you really want to know what it, what the qualifications are to be a pastor, I would say even ask yourself as a pastor, are you willing to open your house? You know, well, you know, in regards to bigger ministries, I know that's kind of hard to do, but are you willing to open your house and dine with the people and that's one thing i could say you know maybe i don't know but do do most do most churches do that like do they offer up their home to come have or go out to have lunch and coffee or just coffee and catch up you know and you know some some church churches are probably not able to do that because of the size but you know um that's one thing that i seen that you do josh and then like aaron said you know it's it's having that shepherd heart yeah Discipleship. Discipleship. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That cannot be lost, man. That's uh that's 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 what we're here to do. So um let's let's move to the next thing. Um, if that's all right, y'all. Um, that was good. That was, was like, I know it's still more on the on the on the it's more meat on that bone, but we're gonna keep it pushing. Yeah. Um so one of the questions that people are asking on both sides, right? Uh they're black people that feel like, you know. This why are people rioting? It doesn't make sense. But uh, I know our white brothers, uh, I've been asked that question um, several times where it's like, you know, what does that accomplish? What does that do? Why are they rioting? And so um, I, I have a perspective on it, but I'm going to throw it out to you guys first and then um, I'll jump in later. What would you guys say? To, you know, you're, you're, if someone's asking you, like, well, you know, I know, you, I know the black community is upset. I know, I know we're, dis we're, dis we're dissatisfied with the justice that we're receiving, but what are the riots? Why are they rioting? What does that do? What would you guys say? To my mind, um, like the question, um, the, the questions, why are they rioting? Why, why are they tearing up their community? Um, like just the separation that, that exists within that question, like why are they rioting? Why are they tearing up their community? I think um, gets to the heart of an issue of like, I see myself as separate from these people. Um, some somewhat different, and obviously race is a difference. But uh, if you live mm -hmm. in the same community, like we're we're one we're one human race, and and I think it, it would be helpful to start to ask myself questions. If I'm asking those questions, why do I see myself so different from these people? Like I, I should be concerned about the community, not why are they tearing up their community, but why are they why why is they tearing up our community? Why why is these things happening? What what is going on in the hearts and minds of these people? And I think mm -hmm. then you can start to to have healthy conversations, just realizing that you are a part of, of this greater group, especially as believers. Yeah. I think, um, thank you for sharing that, Aaron, man, that's real. I think, you know, also for people who don't live in a community, when you're looking maybe at it in another state, when you're looking at it, um, 
like I said earlier, I live in Minnesota. I live in um, Minneapolis. And so I have a different experience and what I'm seeing um, that is very uh, eye-opening to myself. You know? And so a lot of times we are, uh, we kind of were talking about the media and what that portrays. And maybe we'll get into that question a little later. But the media, um, you have to ask yourself, uh, what am I seeing on the media and what, I, what am I being misled by? I can say in particular, me being here, that a lot of people who are looting in this Minnesota, in, in Minneapolis, I don't know about the other states, but in Minneapolis, there's a lot of people who are not even from the community, who are coming from different communities and even out of states that are coming and looting the community. And so a lot of times we can put that on the people who are living in that community without seeing or trying to understand who else is doing this? There are white people looting. There are black people looting. There are Filipino, uh, Asian people looting, Hispanics looting. This is not just a, uh, uh, oh, black people are just looting, um, so we're going to put it on them. There are multiple protesters, and you can find videos out there who have stopped people from looting, African Americans who have stopped people from looting, and people desire to see peaceful protests happening but then the rioters are coming later on in the night. And so that's something I could give you that perspective from somebody who lives here, but everybody's perspective in, in why, um, and when they answer this question is just as valuable as mine. I just live here and I'm able to see that um, it's not just black people. It's, it's right. so many other different people and so, so many different dynamics that the media won't tell you. And so you have to check your heart if you believe and you see this and you just think that why are they and that they are black. You must ask your question, why do I think this way? Because if we are all falling short and we all have sin and are capable of sinning, then that means that one person who is a sinner, is, 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 their, their sin does not outweigh yours because of your skin color. We have all, we all have the capability of, of sinning. So that's the dynamics that I've seen during, um, during the, the riot. It's not just people of color of the, of the man who passed away, but there's so many other people who are here causing havoc and, um, and destroying the community. Right. And I, I think, uh, I mean, I'm in LA, so uh, it's the same downtown LA. Um, there's, there's, there's some of everybody uh, that's participating, you know, mm. I mean, at this one, there's so many of other groups that it, the, you can't miss it on every recording. You see that, you know, there's a, they're not, this is not just a black thing, but, um, I, what I wanted to, what I want to get to is like, you know, as, as, cause I, I'm asking this question for a few friends that were saying, you know, well, well, I, you know, peaceful protests, I, I I'm cool with, you know, I'm obviously not okay with looting and rioting. I'm a believer. I know you're not going to fix sin with more sin, but, um, a question that I, the way I answered this to some friends earlier was in asking the question, you know, why, like, you know, people are upset. There are black people that are out there rioting. You know, this is not, they're yeah. not the only one. So it's like, so the why is, you know, in a general sense, man, people are frustrated. Mm. People yes. are hurting. People are upset. People are saying, man, they can kill us on national TV and in, in, in 2020. And if I were to roll the tape back, I was alive during the Rodney King episode. Mm -hmm. you know? So um, I was in 10th, 11th grade in 92. So when you know when when Rodney King got beat, somebody caught it on the camera phone. There were only peaceful protests up until the court date. Everybody was expecting to get justice, and all officers were acquitted. Man. And that was what kicked off the LA riots. And at, at the time, I'm a teenager. I'm not saved. Why was I out looting? Because it was a I was I was being an opportunist, and I was a sinner, and I was taking advantage of an opportunity to go to the you know, this is how bad it was, this is how old it was, the record shop, and get some, you know, get some, this is records and CDs back then, and, and whatnot, and, and, and just looting, um, however, you know, after the riots, um, then they brought it back, and they did the civil trial, and then they found two of the officers uh, were, were uh, put in jail for 30 months, the other two officers were just fired, um, but it was, it was like, we didn't get any justice until after we rioted, and I know in, in the community where I live, a lot of times when these things happen, Sandra Bland, people are waiting for, you know, what are they going to do about it? And if they don't do the right thing about it, then this is what we're going to do. We're going to riot. We're going to tear some stuff up. We're going to tear it up. And so, you know, 
it's not right. And I, and I, I had this, I, I said this to someone, I said, look, is it wrong that they rioted or is it wrong that we didn't get justice on the front end? You know, uh, I think both are wrong. I think it's wrong that we don't get justice at first. And I also think it's wrong to riot. So um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not able to say to someone when I look at people rioting, I'm, I'm not able to say I don't understand. I can say I don't agree because I'm a believer and I wouldn't participate in that. But yeah, I can't yeah. say I don't understand. I do understand. These are, these are hurting. Some of the people are hurting and frustrated. Some of the people are just being opportunistic and they're taking advantage of this opportunity to do their thing. Um, but there are some people that are out there, man, that are crying. They're, this is they're, this like an adult tantrum. They're crying out to be heard. They're saying, man, we count. We matter. Yep. And, yep. and it doesn't seem like we do. And so we're screaming out this way. It's a really unhealthy way to do it. Um, and, you know, we got, I guess that's something that we can pray about finding better ways, but, um, you know, Phil, do you, sure. Can I ask you, right. um, hey, Phil, do you, oh, see, go ahead. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead Pastor. I was going to ask a question um, regarding that and will maybe, um, Phil, does the, um, from, from, so, from the white community perspective, sometimes when they like, so what had happened is there's, there's an outcry for George Floyd. Everybody has rallied for him. Literally like the whole nation is on their side and, and, and on, on the side of George Floyd and everybody supporting that and crying injustice. It wasn't immediate, but it started to like flood in that wave. Mm -hmm. And then when the riots and the looting broke out, it kind of started to, I think caused the committee co communities who were in support to start to withdraw that in their mind. Like they're like, wait a minute, you know, and they get confused. They don't know how, um, I guess the question is, and brothers, does the, from, from the white community perspective, maybe the black community already fully understands this. Does, um, does the black community fully understand that when they have the support of the nation on their side, do they see that, any movement in that direction um, to start looting or rioting or anything. And, and Dre was pointing out that it's, there's a lot of people going after it and they're, they're, everybody's ruining it. But it's like, you almost think like the, the black community would shout like, do not like everyone stop because we got this. Like we, we got something like, don't, don't blow this one. Like don't mess this up for us. We're, we're, we're getting somewhere. We're moving forward. It's kind of a, it's a long way around, but you, you see what I'm saying? Like, um, yeah, mm -hmm. you feel like the black community as a whole is aware that there are people who want to destroy that opportunity and are, are trying to do that. And, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. I, I think when you're led in anger, um, you know, that, that you're maybe not thinking all the way, you're not thinking about, you know, those other pieces I, something you said you know when they because you know i will say with the um with george floyd it was pretty quick that they that the 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 mayor of that town and they they jumped on it pretty quickly so it wasn't like some of these other cases where they let it go for weeks mm -hmm. or days they were pretty pretty quick and swift about trying to bring justice and letting people know hey we're not letting this go um i think what people don't realize is like it was it was a boiling pot, you know. We had it was it was one thing after another thing, and this was the yeah. This was that last thing that just like blew the top off. Yeah. And yes, people were in support. Even white people were like, "Man, this is wrong. That was injustice." You know, it was one of the. It was so clear. It'd be hard to ignore. And and this is a hard thing, Josh. I still don't know if black people ever feel like we're, we're supported. You know, they mm. just the fact that he got arrested quick. It's like nah, we're you know, why is that guy? Because then, then they put out this guy's rap sheet. This is this is his third black kill. Yeah. So they're so supportive of us. Are they supporting us because they caught this on camera? Or are they supportive because and all, those things, all those things? It's are a fad. Things. It's a fashion. It's like yeah. it, it leads you to think that. Yeah, it leaves room for people to feel like you know, if this hadn't have been caught on camera, that guy would probably still be working and he'd just be dead. It's caught on camera, so it. it all that stuff is still working in people's minds, you know, where it's like, yeah, we, it, it, they did act quickly, but man, this is how many deaths in two months of black people, just boom, boom. Well, well, I, you know, we, we deal with this on a regular basis as far, and I hate to say it, it's true. It, it goes back to what my brother said, what Dre said earlier, that there's a numbness to it. There's a, a feeling of, of 
you know, I, I grew up around this. This is a situation that uh, uh, we as black men were taught, you know what, when you're pulled over, act right. <laughs> you you want to go home, you act right. That's all there is to it. Even if you know you you that person is wrong, you still get some act right in you. Mm -hmm. um, with me in my particular situation, again, li like Bill, you know, I, I grew up, I, I was around during the Rodney King situation. And there was a little legitimate, when you do a comparative between the two, there was a legitimate ill justice uh, that sprung this particular situation. And we got to realize that in that process, it took somewhere uh, from five to 10 years just to get resources back into those neighborhoods that were devastated. And we also got to even look at the neighborhoods that were devastated. Mm. These were the neighborhoods where the people lived and they rioted against uh, community businesses that they felt they received that injustice at, whether mm. it was a liquor store, whether it was a gun store, whatever the case may be. Here in this particular situation, you can almost say that it was timed in some senses, that there was a catalyst that built to it. We can even throw COVID-19 in this, in the mix of this, of this batch of uh, yeah. uh, frustration. Mm -hmm. you know, people have been locked up for a long time, and this is a good time mm -hmm. to bring this up. The, the media itself is not divulging all the information uh, mm -hmm. that they should yeah. about the circumstance. So then you have, um, not an ignorant, but certainly not a well-educated people about the circumstance that are getting frustrated even more and responding mm -hmm. in that frustration. And I agree with Bill. I think there's a situation where you have some people that are truly protesting. Then you have a, a, another group that is opportunistic. And then you have another group that is just, you know, evil and incarnate in some particular situations. And so I think that, um, when we do a comparative of that and other injustices, we put ourselves in a position where we need to also look at the historical value of it. I mean, when you talk about yes. uh, Martin Luther King in his particular situation, mm -hmm. he was willing to take uh, the abuse and so forth uh, in order to bring about a change to an environment. Here we see a breakdown um, not necessarily in all society, but what we're seeing is a breakdown in that particular system of policing. Mm. And, and it makes police, policing look bad all over the country. Yeah. So you go to um, Boston or you go to uh, Baltimore where they've taken policing to a different level where they have had their own injustice. Of course, we've seen that. And they've made changes to strive to pull the community in to be a part of that, um, that policing, where they're policing the police officers who are policing mm -hmm. the community. Here you have a system where maybe that's not in place where it should have been in place, where um, you know, governmental regulation from a higher level, whether that is federal government moving down into state government, should have put something in place to deal with these policing from a very general standpoint. And you're not seeing that. So here, this is where the protest should have been more succinct and direct. It should have been against that particular police department. It should have been something that could have been very nonviolent. And I think it would have gotten a lot more headway towards positive things happening. Because as Bill said, this process went very quickly. He was suspended without pay. He was fired. Then he was arrested. So it, it went yeah. super fast, comparably to other ones. If, if, if I if I can give some if I can also give some background into uh, the state of Minnesota, the, the state of Minnesota has a very uh, Minnesota nice uh, personality, I would say, and um, and the state in the state of Minnesota is very good at hiding um, the racial issues that go on in the state. And so when you when you lit, when you look at different areas, this is a very it's, Minnesota is a very beautiful state, but it's it it. it if you go into the communities, the minority communities, specifically the black community, you can see such a depravity. You can see a system, you can see a, 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 a set of system where it has put them in a position to not succeed beyond what only they have been given the opportunities in their community. In a place like California, mm -hmm. you are able to see a black man who is a professional or someone is successful. You may see that in Atlanta. I don't know how it is in Tennessee or different places, but where I'm from, I was able to experience and see African Americans in successful positions, which gave me hope. But in a state like this, there is little hope 
for the African American that lives here. Now, I'm not making no excuses as to, uh, okay, you're in this position, let's get your mind right. But that is the reality and hard truth. And so when we look at this, a lot of this, this pressure now was put on the mayor to have to expose what happened because it was blowing up so quickly. Minnesota is not a state that necessarily has this, but prides themselves on being Minnesota nice. And so now that that Minnesota nice was being exposed, now the image and character of Minnesota is no longer Minnesota nice, but where, uh, uh, I can't, I don't know how to pronounce his name correctly, but Fadilio uh, uh, Castillo, if I said his name correctly, and now you have uh, George, uh, George Floyd who passed away here at the hands of police officers. And what many people don't know is that these two men worked together outside. He was a security guard. And then this man worked security guard with him at the same exact place. And the police officer along with him was his brother-in-law. And so you see different things that happen that the media won't expose. The media is not telling people that the KKK is terrorizing the neighborhoods around the community, that people mm -hmm. are fearing for their life here. People don't know that. And, and, and that shows why we have so little trust in um, the media, why we have so little trust in police officials is because when things like this happen, we don't even feel protected from something like KKK that has existed for so long to be able to ride around in our communities. They're, they're not exposing though that some of them have been arrested and some of them are from these racial or these racist um, white supremacist group. That's not being exposed to you guys. In, in the world, but I, I can't put that blame on you if it's not being exposed. But now if you hear this, I pray that you would grasp this and that you would understand that there is so much that is going on here that a lot of people are not understanding or they're not able to, they're not being able to see to understand. Um, and so, yeah, I, I leave off at that point. Can, 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 just can, I ask, can I ask a question to everybody just real quickly? And it'll, it'll pin into this and you guys can go buck wild on it. And this may be overly obvious. Does racism still exist? Of of course. Um, I can, <laughs> I can, you know, I can, I can. I mean, it's kind of like a rhetorical question, but it's the elephant in the room. It's kind of yeah. like we can want to, you know, life isn't a Disney story, man. Like, you know, and I think maybe on some other cultures, end, they they're looking through the lens of their own lens, and you know, living in fairy tale land and saying ah you know everything is still good but we can also we can all say that it's 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 the elephant in the room of course you know I can take it to the extent of you know when it comes to a African-American man being unemployed uh I'm gonna take it that far you know I feel like you have a lot of qualified African African-American men out there who have to re retire out of certain positions or who can't get a position because of their race and what makes me to believe that is because of the system that we're brought up in. And then you ask me my perspective on why a black man feel like he has to loot and riot. Well, although I don't condone it because I am a believer and I hold to biblical principles, but the, but the Dion that's in me, this flesh that I battle with understands like Bill and like all you brothers could attest to, we understand the pain. We understand the pain. When you take an African American man, okay, any other race who's listening to you, and I'm gonna try to narrow it down. I don't want to take too much time. But you take an African American man who's set up in a system that's set to fail. And Will and Bill, you guys are older than us. You understand where I'm coming from. You understand, we're put in a system where we're we're set up to fail, and now we're just trying to climb that ladder. But as we're climbing that ladder, the other races are way above you. You're just trying to play catch up. So what do you do when you have a, a African-American culture who's been suppressed and suppressed and suppressed, and although it's not right for them to act out in anger and loot, but when you try to kneel and they say no, when you try to hold hands and walk and they say no, when you try to peace, pro you know, just in, in, in a way that is as peaceful as possible, then you have a group of people that come and say, no, we're going to stop that as well. It's a recipe for disaster in a sinful culture. Mm -hmm. It's just a recipe for, and I can just say that, you know, like sometimes I ask myself now when I was in a situation where I was able 
to give my service to a company or a situation and I fill out that job application and they say, no, you're not qualified, but yet I gave you all my time. Is mm. it because of my race? Mm. Am I not qualified enough? So I shouldn't be as an African-American unemployed right now. And I'm just, I, not because I'm good or something. I know my work ethic and I'm not saying this is the instance with every company. Forgive me if that, if that's making me seem that way, but I fill out count, countless of applications. And then after how many times do you, so my point is in America, how many times do you have to be told no until you say, okay, well, I'm going to go out and get it. And that's just through the thought of a, of a man who's not under God's sovereignty is grace. How many yeah. times you tell a sinful man, no, after so many times, he's going to go out and take it. And so I think that's what's going on with the with with, with, with the looting and the race. With the, just with everything that's going on, I think that's just my perspective in it. I think like uh, as a black man, like there's experiences that we have from, from day one till today that uh, people of different cultures or races will never understand. And uh, not, not that I ever expect them to. I'm not desiring, like I don't want someone to come apologize to me because you don't know how I feel. Like, it's, it's nice, I guess, in the idea that you're, you're concerned or you're compassionate, you're aware. Um, but like to your point, Josh, of like, well, how can you see that everyone's behind you and all of a sudden you, you, you would go so far as to allow or see people in your community looting and not want to stop it so that you can continue the support that you're receiving? I think it's not as simple as that because there's mm. a lot of, of experiences and things that you face. It's not just this one thing that oh, they're all with us, everyone's on our team, they're supporting us, we can just turn it off now. And, and everything that you've experienced up until this point, every time that mm. you uh, walk into a grocery store, every time you were denied an application, or every time, like all those things don't just disappear because all of a sudden I have support after this one incident. Like it, it's not as, as easy as that. And so for a person to think that like, oh, well, everyone's supporting, everyone in America is supporting uh, the injustice and then you guys messed it all up because you went to start looting. Like, that's just, it's, it's so, it, it almost, like, it just, it seems, un mm. it just undermines, like, the experience of, of what those mm. people are, have experienced their entire life. It's not yeah. just like one instance, and I can, I can flip it off because now I feel like America's supporting the injustices that, or they're aware of the injustices. Like, that doesn't erase the time that I got pulled over for, for no reason, or that doesn't erase the time that I saw someone in my family get, you know, mistreated like that. It doesn't just turn off like that. So it's not as simple as that to say mm -hmm. we can stop uh, the looting because, you know, we have the support and let's just, let's maximize it now. Like it would be great if that was the case, but it's not, it's a lot deeper than that. And, yeah. and uh, I think um, in, in movement to the past, I mean, we mentioned Martin Luther King Jr. many times, uh, he was, I believe, called by God for a unique time, and he was a leader. He was able to, people were willing to follow, and and I'm not saying that there aren't leaders today in, in the, the Black community, um, but I, I desperately desire to see a, a Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, who is filled with the Spirit of God and is leading with yep. truth and uh, is leading people in a direction of progress and, and is opening uh, dialogues and, and conversations mm -hmm. that will uh, allow an entire community as a whole, white, black, Puerto Rican, Chinese, Asian, to, to heal and to see these, these uh, differences as uh, opportunities for us to learn and to grow and to make a better future. At the end of the day, we all wanna see a better future for our kids. I mean, yeah, all of us wanna see a future that would, would continue to be sustainable. Uh, I mean, there's this great big push for global, uh, you know, the climate change and, and going green and being sustainable and all these things, going vegan. Um, like what we're in a black community, we just want to see a sustainable future for my kids. Like uh, yeah, amen. I continue amen. to see uh, situations that exist in our culture that that they just worry me. Like I have to have conversations mm. with my son that somebody will never have to have. Mm. Yeah, I, I um it was a loaded question. I get that. And I, and I appreciate you guys answering that. And I would agree with you because racism does still exist. But when we talk about that racism, we realize that it is not just an African-American problem. We know that it is a um, Mexican-American problem. We know that it is a 
uh, or a Latin American, I should say, or a, a Middle Eastern problem, or it's a um, uh, an Asian problem. It's it's a problem with any minority that lives within uh, the country, even if we just look at the differences. This is not just a black male problem. This is a black <laughs> female problem. These are problems that exist uh, within all of us uh, around, and we need to be united in a way that Dr. King even expressed. I mean, even if we don't use Dr. King, we can talk about Sidney Poitier, who was also a uh, a massive fighter of uh, civil rights during that time. We can talk about so many people that were willing to sacrifice their position and who they are and what they what was considered comfortable today in order to restrain themselves, in order to bring about change for all people, not just one race of people, not just one type of person. Exactly, and, and I don't mean to uh, to diminish the the fight that you know other minority groups like. There's so many microcultures that exist. I mean, in the females, the gender gap is still there, like uh, the, the gender pay gap is still there. There's, there's a lot of different uh, situations that are unfair. And, and to say that the, the situation that I'm facing and that I'm concerned about, um, it's not that it's the only one that exists. It's not yeah. like, uh, I heard an illustration that a man shared one time uh, that like, when I say black lives matter, it's not to the exclusion of every other life. Yeah. It's like saying that, you know, my. I had a family member who died of breast cancer and I'm saying that I'm going to go march for breast cancer to raise awareness for breast cancer. It doesn't mean that I don't care about heart disease. It doesn't mean that I don't care about AIDS. It doesn't mean I don't care about any of these other things. It's just that this is important to me because it's close to home. Like it has affected me as an individual and I'm passionate about that thing. So to take offense to that is not, um, it's not meant to, to, to be an offense to every other uh, opportunity yeah. or every other um, injustice, but this is something that is important to me. You look at the screen, there's, a, there's black faces here, and, and this is something that we experience, and, and it's something yeah. that is concerning to us and not to the exclusion of every other issue. I'm still passionate about other issues too, most importantly, the salvation of lost souls. And, and I think that um, the goal of all this is to get to that point where we can have conversations where the church can be effective in reaching into this community or to other communities uh, that experience injustice and be able to be effective because they are concerned, genuinely care, and, and want to see uh, the glory of God uh, be yeah. on display. And, and man, um, you know, some may disagree with what I'm, what I'm gonna say, but um, it's for me to say, I think in America, the biggest, the group that has been oppressed the most is the African-American group. And I understand that other people go through what they go through. And what I see so many times is um, when, when there is an oppression, when there is a black man murder, whenever something that happens, um, there is something always aligned with what we're going through. I believe that takes away from the real issue that exists in America. And this is not me saying that I don't care about um, a Hispanic in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the immigration. I'm not understanding, I'm not trying to, any other minority group that have, that have experienced what they've experienced in life. Um, but when I see that a, a minority family can come here and get land, while people who have lived on this soil can obtain land in our denied houses, when I see that there is, there is a target on the African-American community in America, I have to stand by what we are going to in the fullness at this time and pray that God brings a healing over our culture and brings a healing over our community. Because I've, I've, I'm, I've been racially, I've been called a nigger by Hispanics. I've been called a nigger by Asians. I've been called a nigger by every other group. I have a buddy, Jordan, who did 12 years in the penitentiary and no group will bunk beds with African-Americans, but they'll bunk beds with every other single group inside of a cell. And this is, and once again, I'm not trying to take away from anybody else's experience, but when we look at how influential our culture is, we see that our culture is used in so many ways, but when, it, when the going gets tough, nobody wants to stand by us. Everybody wants to say that everybody wants to say nigga, but when you see one get shot and other times besides this, when it wasn't a trend, there was nobody to stand by us. When, 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 when things hit the fan, when we go through battles, when we go through uh, battles at a job, when, 
you're being profiled or things are happening, you have that other minority friend in that community at that job, and you're going through what you're going through. They're not willing to put their job on the, on the line for you, not even our own people are. And so a lot of times with this battle that we face, a lot of times, like, it's cool to see Black people come together, but even in our own culture, we don't stand by each other. We, we, we have been so embedded through the media and in our minds to even hate ourselves. And that's why this issue is so deep because they have put on the media and television for decades and decades for us to hate ourselves, for us to hate black women, for us to see black women as sexual objects and toys where we don't even desire our own women. They have uh, black, they have black face and, 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 and dove into our culture in such a way where it hit our culture and even white churches didn't take the time to stand up. And that's why it's frustrating to see today nobody say anything when it comes to it because of fear that you may lose people in the congregation. And, that, and, and, and that's my heart behind it. I, I, I respect and I love minority, other minorities and, and their issues, man. I, I stand by it. But, I, but it, it really, it, 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 a lot of times the attention is taken away from the true issue I heard somebody say, I heard somebody say, we need to fight for this and let's make sure after this we fight for gay rights. There's a battle even with that, that people with gay rights are even tying themselves to a battle that we fight every day. It is not even comparative. There's no way that it is comparative. We have nothing in common. Your desire for extra rights to love another man or woman isn't comparative to my desire to be treated as a normal human being. Our battle comes from so many different angles. It is not just, uh, it is not just this one. White men look at me and my wife all the time when I come into a restaurant. I can't even, when I go back to our hometown, people look at me uh, in such a, in, in, in a despicable manner. So I know that I'm, I'm talking on this, but I, I just, it, it, it's really, it, it, it's a passion of mine and it's really hurtful, man, that like every time we go through these issues, we have to make sure everybody else is comfortable by talking about their issues so people can accept ours. Mm -hmm. And it's not disrespectful to what anybody said, but every time this has, this happens every single time where everybody has to be comfortable around us when we're at a job we have to make sure people are comfortable when we go to the store we have to step out the way or we have to make sure that everything we do that people are cautious of us because our skin makes us a threat for somebody white as soon as they're born their skin color is valued they never have to explain themselves but we do yes i leave it with that let me do this first of all um man i appreciate you you know we said we was gonna be raw, and uh, I mean, you came through. You know? <laughs> so, but that's, I know you share from the heart. You know I mean, I know you meant what you said, and uh, I mean, this this is pouring out of my heart right now. I I I feel like it'd be a good time to turn a gospel corner. You know, what absolutely, I mean? absolutely, absolutely. And, and I I if I could address like you, my brother, right? I wanna yeah. I wanna address like, how old are you, bro? I'm 29. 29. All right, I'm I'm 44. So, um. I mean, I'm hearing you and I'm like, man, I relate, I relate, I relate. And then I just, I know some stuff and I, I feel like I've been helped and I want to, I want to just pour this out, man. Cause, uh, I, I feel like there are things that we, we, we need from each other as well. You know what I mean? And so like, first, let me just start with just the, I hear the frustration as far as, man, I walk in a place, looked a certain way. Uh, opportunities denied, you know, doors that, that just, they're just not naturally open. Um, and all of, all of those things, man. And this is, I carry, you know, when I got saved and I, I come from the street, so I, I come from, you know, I, I got my own. And so when I came to Christ, some of that had to be laid down and put aside. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still, I struggle with how do, how do I manage this now in Christ? You know what I mean? How do I, how do I deal with that? How do I not I don't want to be angry all the time. You know what I mean? I don't want to be walking around frustrated. Yeah. And, and here's the thing, man. I, 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 and I feel like the, the, what God does in our hearts, man, is without the world around us changing, you know, God is able to do something in us. You know what I mean? Because um, there's nothing I can do to change the world that's around me. 
Yeah. There is something powerful that God will do in us. And some of it's a matter of perspective. All of it is wound up in what the gospel means for us. Right. And so, you know, when I, 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 there was a time when, you know, I would go on an interview, I would go to something, the door would be shut and I would be like, yo, they, they didn't give me that opportunity because of the color of my skin. Uh -huh. as, I, as, as I came into relationship with the Lord and, and even growing in my knowledge of the word, you know, um, there's a verse in Proverbs, man. It says that the hearts of the kings are in his hands and like the rivers of water, he turns them wherever he wishes. Mm. And, and, and it, it speaks of just the sovereignty of God, that God is yeah. ultimately in charge. And I remember at that point, I said, you know what, man, because I was young, I was early, I was newly married. Um, and it was like, if a door gets shut, there's not a man in the world that can shut a door on me. God wants open. Mm -hmm. now, on, the, on, the end, <laughs> on the end, on the end of the shut door, Amen. there might literally be a guy that's like, yo, I didn't, I don't, I didn't pick you because you were black. I didn't like how you look, but God is sovereign over that, that, that yeah. as long as I, as long as I'm tucked away in Christ, mm. there's not a man on the planet that can keep me from what God has for me at all. Then as I come into Christ, you know, as, as the things that God gives me, there ain't a man on the planet that could take from me what God has decided for me to have. So even if I lose something, um, man, God is sovereign over my life. God, you're my provider. I don't even look to mm -hmm. man to provide. Here's the thing. You can't disappoint me. I don't look to you, right? If I'm on a job, I'm yeah. going to do my job. But if I'm not going to kiss your butt, I, I, I honor God. God has blessed me. God is my provider. Mm. If you fire me and if you fire me harshly, God, you shut that door. You know, you yep. open doors yep. and no man shut, you shut doors and no man open. Yep. That perspective kept me from going at people's necks, you know, yeah. from or or from even giving them as much giving them that much credit. You couldn't have told me no, unless it was God's will for me, if it wasn't God's will for me to be here. Um, and mm. that's just like that's one piece. I mean, that's like one piece of how. I feel like the gospel, it, it, it influences, man is not in charge of my life. Yes, I'm a black yeah. man in America. And I'm going to say this, bro. You privileged, right? Every, at every generation, man, you didn't, you didn't pick to be born. By the will of God, by the sovereign will of God, bro, you black at this time in history. Yeah. You are what you are. And yeah. there's, there's, there's purpose on that, right? I'm a black man at this time in history, but I'm a black man that's born again. And there's something God wants to do in me and with me and through me. And... I got to be aware, just like you do, that the enemy is fighting against that tooth and nail, right? If, if Satan can get me to focus on what men are doing, focus on, you know, uh, I can focus on so many things that knock me off of, you know, yeah. I got, I got, I have a, I have a, I have a, I have a purpose in this life. You know, God told yeah. me I do, right? Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God yeah. has for him, that we should walk in them, right? And so that's what I am. And um, it, there may, you know, some other brothers born white, some other brothers born Hispanic, some other brothers born Asian, and it's, it's true for them too. But for you and I, it, it, you know, everybody has their own challenges. I'm just saying this, that all the challenges that, that being in this package comes with, um, you are well able, you are well able in Christ mm -hmm. to overcome every challenge, to become everything you're supposed to be, um, scripture says you are more than conquerors mm. him who loves us. Mm -hmm. right? And, um, and so, you know, it, 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 none of that takes away from the fact that is it a challenge for sure? You yeah. know, do I feel some kind of way when the police get behind me? Yes. Am I worried for my sons? Yeah. Do I pray harder than I would if they were white? Yep. Um, but it's okay. I just, that's what I got to do. You know, mm -hmm. um, I got to pray and, and I, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'll close this. I'll say this last thing and then I'll, I'll, I'll toss it back to, uh, Josh or one of you guys, but um, with regard to all that we see going on, you know, the deaths, the killings of this, all these different things, I do think that it's really important um, for me, right? As a black man that's in a position, I'm a Christian. I got, I have access and influence to people that Josh doesn't. Just like Josh has access to in, an influence in the people's world where I'm not. Um, mm -hmm. I think that each one of us got to carry the gospel um, even the truth is I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in my church to frustrated black folk that used to gangbang, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I got to give them a perspective that says, I, 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 I understand where you're yeah. coming from, yep. but God, you know, but Christ, I yeah. got to know it. I got to believe it. I got to be helped by it. Mm -hmm. I got to be comforted by it. Um, but then I got to share it because 
one of the one of the traps that I see us falling into is looking everywhere else but God. But God. Yes. You know, yes. I think people thinking that if, if we had the right people in office, it would help us. It won't help us. Man. If we yep. had the right, if, if we could change all the police officers and make them black, it wouldn't help us. Mm-hmm. Um, there is, if, if we have to come to the point where we believe that nothing helped but Jesus. Yes. The, end of the, day, the, the yes. only thing we're looking to to help us is the Lord. And yeah. Yeah. that's where the black church, the white church, the Hispanic church, the Asian church, the b- believers of all, if we all come to the table saying there's no help except for, from God. Yeah, that'll unify yeah. It right there, and and everything that needs to happen from there can happen. But as long as there's groups that feel like, you know, if, if we marched harder, if we did this, if if the police were that, if we had these people in office, as long as believers are looking somewhere but Christ, um, we'll stay divided, fragmented, and we'll be we'll be lacking the help that we should be tapping into, you know. And so, um, that's that's my rant, man. I I I, I just want to. I just want to, and I'll say this, I'll make this very quickly because I know other people got to talk after I just talked the whole time. I mean, I just, I just really want to thank you for chiming in and, and, and speaking that because I think that um, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a place where I, I, I know other black men, but I'm seeing a lot of people fight this battle um, as, if God, I, as if prayer doesn't work anymore. And I think me and Dion was talking about this and... Um, and I, I've been I've been on the side of, of, of desiring to fight the good battle and stick in the scripture. And, and where Second Timothy two talks about um, soldiers of Christ don't get entangled in civilian pursuits, where where the word of God is speaking to us and how we should march during these times as we still have a heart for it. But I think that this is such a beautiful reminder to me because at times I feel alone in saying how we're going about this is wrong because I feel like Christ isn't the center. And when everybody's around you is fighting this battle in such as world in, in a manner where we want justice, we want justice as if, and I'm, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this, it breaks my heart that we see this black man get killed like this. But I'm not seeing a lot of Christians ask, man, I pray that he have salvation yeah. because he may, he may have could been innocent and died innocently in, in our eyes on this earth. Yeah. But if he's not innocent in the eyes of God, then our battle mm-hmm. to fight for an innocent man's life is not innocent soul. to God. Yeah. Not only, and I'm going to say this, not only one time that I even, I can think of that I even pray for the officer. And yeah. I'm throwing myself out. When did I pray for the officer who did this? Yeah. And I'm calling yeah. myself out. I didn't. Yeah. And I think that, um, I mean, when we talk about this from a Christian perspective, I mean, you yourself, uh, Josh, you're, you're currently teaching on a type of Christ right now when we look at Joseph and all the things that he went through. What is that, um, when you take that in consideration, how does that work in your heart? What is? What do you think of when you think of the message that you're teaching from a Joseph perspective and you see the injustices that you've seen recently? Yeah, I mean, um, there is a huge parallel, and I don't mean to misspeak. I'm just speaking freely to my brothers here, like of what I've been working through in the text. And you, you see from both perspectives, you see a guy who is sold into slavery by his own brothers. His own brothers throw him in the pit. They sell him into slavery. And he sits there in prison for 13 years wondering if God's there. And if anybody's going to help him, if anybody's going to save him. And the Lord obviously was watching him the whole time. And we see the Lord um, show up in a powerful way by letting him interpret dreams for Pharaoh. Before you know it, he's standing there second in command next to Pharaoh, and he's ruling the nation. And it literally says the entire earth came to Joseph because of the famine. And now he has, a, he has the opportunity to drop the hammer on anybody he wants to. And what does he do? Full of the grace and mercy of God, he welcomes his brothers into the palace. He feeds them good food. He blesses them. He serves them. And his heart is so tender towards the Lord, even though they had done so much wrong against him. He goes away multiple times and just weeps and cries because he just can't believe that he gets to see his brothers again. There's huge injustice, and you see God sovereign over the whole situation. Like, he's literally watching the whole thing. And the Lord, it feels like he's not there. It feels like... There's moments it's like, Lord, are you even in this? What are you doing? Like, I, I'm sitting here by myself. Are you going to do anything? 
And it's amazing how fast the tables turn. I love, you know, what was being said, just how God knows what he's up to, you know, and, and he, he is holding each of his children. The Psalms also say he will not withhold anything good from those who walk uprightly. So if he's withholding something, it's got to be, maybe it's not good. Maybe it's not the good thing right now. You know, he's going to kind of pour goodness on his people forever. It's hard to wait. It, it is hard to wait. Yeah, but Isaiah 40, 31, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I, uh, that's some of the stuff the Lord's shown me, Will, you know, um, the parallels and what's going on. And um, when I hear these grace bombs and mercy bombs coming from you guys in the midst of all this going on, it's just, it's beautiful. It's the gospel on great display. We want justice. We want the Lord to show up and settle things, no doubt. We want our society to do that. And then when the Christian brothers show up and try to show love to their neighbor, regardless of all the chaos, I mean, that's the gospel. That's Jesus. I mean, it's the most beautiful thing that can happen. Yeah. And I can't agree more. And I just want to add, you know, that, you know, there's this, there's a dynamic that God is sovereign and that's really over everything. But the beauty of it is he uses people mm. to work on his behalf. He works through them. To love another person I, uh, is, is God working through a person to love on another person. What I just witnessed right now was two brothers in Christ. One of them just had, Bill just had to talk to Dre and encourage him because of the oppression that Dre has faced. And I just want to say as an encouragement, as a charge to all the people who are seeing oppression, who are seeing what's happened to the black community, you can be a part of loving on the people to where situations like that won't have to happen. You see, and God can use you through that. And it can be a powerful thing. That's one of the agendas that are trying to be pushed is that the people who are seeing this would come and help the black community be restored, be loved, you know, be considered as equal. Just a little something, you know, chiming in on. I, I really agree with that because uh, I feel like um, a lot of times people are searching for, like, what can I do? How can I help? And, and I think, um, like you said, uh, being effective in your sphere of influence, like um, making a difference in your area uh, can, can, that's, that's, that's the good stuff. Like, I mean, I don't want you to come apologize to me. The next time your friend uh, says a racist thing, like check them. Like that, that's more powerful. That's more effective for me. That's more um, uh, a positive moving in the right direction is, is you standing up for injustice when no one else sees, when, when it's not popular to post it on your social media or, or to, yeah. to go to protests. Like uh, do it when no one else is watching. When, when uh, the, the guy at work makes the, the, the comment about the girl, um, check them. Like, don't allow those type of injustices to continue because it's the little things that build up to the big things. And if, if people would take the initiative and, and really be as bold as they, they pretend to be in the comment section, like do that in real life in your sphere of influence and make an impact there, I think is, uh, is, is an opportunity for people to, to see change happen. True. Mm -hmm. Man, it's like yeah. social media, like I've been looking at it and I ain't really- Hey D, I think Travis is about to speak. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Trav. My bad, Travis. My bad, Trav. <laughs> no, you're good, you're good. No, I was just gonna um, just really touch. Um, hold on, actually, it got dark. No, I was gonna just say, uh, basically, uh, what you guys said is, is so true, especially, uh, you know, what, what Bill said to, to Dre, is you know we we are privileged you know we're privileged we're privileged in God's eyes and and the, the thing is look look at our position look at where we are and you know you look at how God is moving us you know you you, you take a you take a a black guy that's only seen black churches and only understands black culture and nothing else moves him to you know and moves him to a predominantly white church and now you have uh, opportunity to grow and now um, that brother right there can now bring more education and even vice versa 
the white guy going to a black church, you're bringing um, awareness also because now you have more, you know, um, <clears throat> resources. The church has more resources. So how we use all of this, um, we're talking right now about racism and stuff. And it's the duty of like the church, the church to, uh, to make sure that, you know, their congregation is not just sitting in the pew, three or four people in there that's full on racist. They should have some kind of conviction in the church. Um, probably, you know, either them getting up and leaving, seeing that before, they should, um, they should understand that the church does not condone this and we should be bold we should be bold yep. we should pray for boldness pray for, um, for that to for the lord to um, help us speak about that in our churches and um it's, it's so key and then like will asked the question on um are we are is racism still going on and yes, it is. And people need to really understand that. I think we touched bases when they said, um, is it people who care because they see it is big right now? It's on the media because it's happening every day. Nobody's seen the guy that called me the N-word um, um, on my lunch break. Nobody's seen that officer, you know, because it's not recorded. We need to, uh, the, and this is where the gospel comes in because if the gospel, if the Holy Spirit is in you, if you have the gospel fully under, if you're understanding the gospel and you're in a church where it is preached that, then the, the congregation, the people will understand what is sin and, and what it, or what God um, um, loves and what he hates. And we all know he hates sin this if this is implemented then obviously people but it's not going to happen because you know it's when christ comes back then the world is going to be better but while we're here right now that's what we're fighting for we're, we're here on this earth to spread the gospel to to speak about the good news Bro, and facts. people are not everybody's not going to get it because we know facts. the word says that every those that say lord lord um we're not into it all right <laughs> amen amen oh, there you go yeah try it i don't know if it's funny the faces are funny or your bluetooth is your bluetooth is, is phasing out breaking up uh, on us that's the only <laughs> way the racism is going to end that's the only way that white privilege can you know this is happening every day not just george not just george floyd is he my black skin and <laughs> what about now he's catching up yeah. right now yes we so, uh, I, you know, I, I, you know, I have to say this, and I think uh, one of the brothers was about to say it. I think it was Dion I was going to talk about social media, and it's interesting to me that, um, yeah, I believe that racism does still exist, but I think racism has a new face. Uh, I think it has a, a a new vice in in society, and I think that um, if that is the case, then we as uh, you know, the older older we are, even the younger we are, have to consider the, the newer generation, figure out that way that we're going to fight and combat this, uh, this sense of racism, because that has to change as well. Whether that's by, you know, Dion, like you were going into uh, everything that you've seen on social media, or whether that's, uh, you know, boycotting in a different way. We gotta find those ways to, uh, to actually be effective, especially for the gospel and for the sake of those who are lost today, because we got to speak their language, like you said, Bill, or we are not effective. Right. Trev, you're back. Did you want to finish that thought? Um, which, which, uh, what was I exact? What were we exactly? Cause I heard him, we're talking about social media in general. 
No. Dre, where you at, Dre? No, <laughs> Travis' phone. Hey, Travis' phone went out. They trying to get Travis to. to, 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 to oh, is he, you were talking to Travis. He says, when yeah, he Travis was phone. talking. I thought he said Dre. My bad. My bad. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we, we can hear you, bro. No, oh, okay. no. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, oh, uh, yeah. My, I just moved. I don't have internet, so I'm using my iPad. Got it. <laughs> you gotta find that sweet spot. You're good. Yeah, I am. I went downstairs, so. But yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I, honest, I don't remember why I stopped that off. But uh, basically, what I was just saying was um, the the awareness needs to be to be, needs to be brought to the community. They need to see this every day, not just when it happens. True. So I need. I honestly, I need. We need everybody to care every day. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Not just. And, not and just. That's, on one day. Go ahead, Chad. Right, that's the gospel. That's that's what you know, us as a church, that's what we as, um, you know, church leaders and, and um, just the church period is, that's what we need to um, bring awareness to. We need to bring awareness of the sin problem we have. And, and I think that's it's so important. So I got a question for the group chat. Um, something I was even asking my say, myself this is, you know, maybe for a, a different culture uh, who's asking between their culture, like how can we say Black Lives Matter when and we see uh, blacks killing blacks all day long? Like, like how can we stand up with y'all? How can we how can we go out there and support y'all when y'all kill y'all are the advocates and the 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 post the poster board for you know gang banging and all of this? You know what are you what are you, what are you guys' views on that and how would you respond if you know, I would I would love this. With that culture? Mm -hmm. I, I would love to test, say something real quick. I think um, the Black Lives Matter movement, man, is something that we got to be cautious of. I'm not. I'm not talking about saying the words Black Lives Matter. I'm saying the movement and what has been created. Um, as believers in Christ, uh, we know what the word of we know what the word of God says uh, about uh, where we have our, our alliance to. And I think that a lot of times with movements like this, a lot of people can fully give their alliance to. Uh, a movement like this that has no intentions of giving glory to God. And we know if anybody knows the history, Black Lives Matter was created by two women who are uh, who are lesbian women and who uh, have certain intentions and agendas they would like to push along with the Black Lives Matter movement. So I think that in the midst of that, when it comes to the movement, I believe that the movement is very flawed because it's created by men and women or whatever they call themselves, it's flawed by that. And and so in, with that, there is the caution that we need to take now, but saying Black Lives Matter, those words, I believe that we have to be very clear in separating ourselves from the, from the midst of uh, that versus I'm a Black man and I believe that Black Lives Matter and what we see today. Mm -hmm. um, the Black man with Black on Black killing themselves, I think there's a lot of this this is a this is a question that always gets asked a lot of times during this time, and I believe that's why you asked it. It's 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 very tough to answer because we know that the community was put in a position, like I was saying earlier, like even through the music that we listen to, the music that we listen to that causes I'm gonna go shoot it in word, I'm gonna go do this, I'm gonna go do that. It's so influential <laughs> to the manner of which they live that it numbs them to being okay with killing themselves. So I think when people ask that question, I would ask them to go look deeper into the issue um, of what happens because it's okay when a black person kills a black person, but it's not okay when we see a cop kills a black person because it affects somebody in such a deeper way because you see the cop is normally white. Um, but I think there needs to be like a deeper dive into people who ask those questions because normally like we don't, there's some black communities that love each other, love themselves. But I think as general, my experience in the black community is that um, I, I feel that I don't necessarily feel a love more than I feel a, I'm always on guard, what you looking at, what you trying to do. Yeah, and I just want to add to that, that um, you know, there can be this instantaneous assumption to make at, oh, you know, to answer your question, D, like, a person from the outside sees that well, black man killing a black man, and there could just be like this this writing off of 
black people, you know. But I like what Dre said, and just you know, kind of building on what Dre said. There's, it's very important to go at and ask yourself, why are they doing that? Mm-hmm. And really, by researching it, the oppression of black people, you'll find the answer. You know, and the answer goes back to even moments throughout time, like slavery, when black people were purposely pitted against each other. You know, so you have things like that that are rooted within the black community that carry into today. Because Harriet Tubman died, um, you know, 1905 or around that area. That's, that's, you know, a little bit over 100 years ago. You know, so that's not far, far away when these oppressing things were rooted in our community. So... Mm-hmm. I, it's just important, and I, just to you know, finish the thought. Jesse Williams said um, he, he was on BT and he made a statement. He said, um, "If you have a critique against, you know, the community, you better have an established record of critique of the oppression that they had." Mm. It, and it's a really good statement because it will mm. now give you the ability to understand where they're coming from why they're doing that instead of just going and, oh, look at them doing that. Let me just write them off. Oh, look, they are those type of people that are stereotyped. Yeah. Well put, Ian. Yeah, that was a good one, Ian. Yeah. So let me ask, can I ask this question to you guys? Would you, do you guys think as believers, black men that are believers, should we disassociate ourselves from the Black Lives Matter movement? Should those be things that we we disassociate ourselves from, um, or do you guys feel comfortable associating with, with that? I think, uh, personally, I believe we need to be critical of all things. Uh, in the light of scripture, in the light of our understanding and knowledge of God, and certainly through prayer. Uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, NAACP, uh, CORE, whatever the case may be. We have to be, if we're called to scrutinize even the churches that we go through, uh, why wouldn't I do Black Lives Matter? That's my opinion. Okay. I'll throw this thought out to us. This is, these are my thoughts, you know, so they're just mine. <laughs> is I'm cautious of, like, I'm already on a team, right? I'm yeah. already, like, you know, forgive the gangbang analogy, but if I'm already from a gang, um, I can only be from one gang, you know what I mean? I only rep one set, you know? So if I've said, man, I've aligned myself with Christ, I'm a Christian, and that that has certain beliefs. It has certain, you know, there, there's certain things that I'm, that I'm um, it has rules. It has a belief system. It has an enemy. It has all of it. Has, it, has, it has friends. It has enemies. It has all of that. Then, you know, I would, I would be careful now. I'm, I'm on this team over here aligning myself with other groups that violate aspects of the team over here. You know, if I'm, yeah. if I'm, if I'm representing Christ and I realize why this movement, there's one piece of this movement I agree with, we're acknowledging to a world that maybe doesn't value black lives, that they do matter. But everything else that the movement stands for, I disagree with, right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not equating blacks with homosexuals, right? I'm not equating being black with some of the different things. So. For me, I would say like yeah, I wouldn't. I would never use their slogan because um, they they now they've copyrighted it and they fighting over who can get paid for using it. So yeah. I don't got to use. I I could say I could I could say that my life matters a whole lot of ways. You know what I'm saying? But mm-hmm. um, and, and again, I could just bring it back to the gospel, man. Every you know, at the end of the day, um, if God says that we've all been made in His image, then you know my. That's the value of my life. The value of my life is that I'm an image bearer. I, I exactly. bear the image of God. And so whether I'm looking at a black man or a Hispanic man or Asian man, but in particular, as I live in a world where certain groups are not as valued, um, that's going to be the strength of my argument. You know, why, why do these lives, because they've been made in the image of God. That's why that life was valuable. That's why you can't just flush that down the t- That's Amen. why you can't just you know, treat a man like that, that he's made in the image of God. And that way, I never have to associate with something that that I can't rock with a hundred percent. I'm already associated with something that I could go a hundred with, you know. Amen. Amen. 
Bill, is there a way? So, would you say that um, the white community hashtag and BLM or hashtag and Black Lives Matter is that helpful? Is that a hindrance? Is that confusing? Um, you know, people in the white community um, are nervous to say anything in support of. Some are nervous to not say anything and feel like they absolutely thousand percent have to support. You got, you know. I personally feel this way. Anything I see a white person do that's trying to be supportive, even if they get it wrong, I appreciate it. I, yeah. I understand what you're saying. So if yeah. I see somebody white yeah, trying to so they, they, they get up the BL, they try. hey, I know what you meant. I appreciate that. I love they you. Try. Um, we don't gotta I'm get more so. Right. I'm more so have. Hey, hey, anything is better than nothing. And yeah, yeah. For real. I more yeah. so have a problem with, and kind of along the lines of what Aaron mentioned back earlier, is that. You know, we, we're dealing with this on a daily basis, okay? Like, you know, and I and I piggyback off of Bill and everybody. I appreciate all that love, you know. But then the other side of me is like, this is a daily fight. You know, this is daily. This is something daily that happens, and a specific situation that surfaced, which was the Kaepernick whole ordeal. Everybody was bashing Kaepernick on social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, all throughout the media, all throughout the media, not just well, in any platforms. Bad guy got blackballed right? out of football for that. Blackballed out of football, and now all of a sudden they matter because you hashtag in it today. And like I said, I we do appreciate it, and you know, hey, it is what it is. But it's a it's a daily thing. Just as Aaron brought up, he mentioned it's a daily. It's something that we have to walk through daily. It's cool that you're coming out and helping us, and it's cool that you're going out here throwing the hashtags and posting the pictures with the with the mask and the black shirts. You know that that's fine. I understand that, but I would my hopes is to see you carry that on from here on out. Like it's just yeah, we don't. It it can, it can look like it's just a trend and it's a fad, yeah, you know. Yeah. But you, we, D, can I can I ask you one more? Is it do you think that it's hurtful to promote the brand like by that what, what do you what do you guys think about that like um in, in support of you have a lot of white people wanted to support their black friends and they're promoting the brand which is building it larger which the movement kind of wants to take advantage of it and use it for their own agenda what do you guys you know man i i you know um i think i told you guys a little earlier man like where i am um, from church meetings to uh, regular businesses to uh, Black Lives Matter signs on a lawn next to many different other supports of, of, of different things. I've, I've, when I first moved to Minnesota, I, was, I went to a church that was very socially justice driven. And at the beginning, I needed that because I needed to have uh, an understanding or comfort as to why um, and I'll go into why I don't think like the Black Lives Matter and those things, why I wouldn't associate with it. While I'm in the midst of these things, I'm, I'm little by little, I'm beginning to see that there is social justice is becoming the center of the gospel, mm. right? I believe that there's a way of going taking over what the center of the gospel should be, which is Christ. And so while I'm sitting in this church, I'm learning, but I'm checking the demeanor and, and, and the attitude of different members in the church. And there is this, there is this white people sit down, you need to listen. And so what came with that is I realized that even my wife, my wife being a white woman, I had to take my wife and myself away from that church because I didn't want my wife to carry this demeanor of a white guilt, of being ashamed of who she was in Christ. But I also have had multiple conversations living here where I've had a compassion and sadness over white brothers and sisters in Christ. Because once you start to have these conversations and you start and you begin and white people begin to start to have this white guilt, then they begin to, um, it's like a, a, a never ending cycle of them not knowing what to do, of them always feeling that they, 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 what they've done is horrible, what they... It, it's it's I'm witnessing it in so many different people. Of if they don't post on social media, then people disown them. If they don't post uh, this murder or these things, if they are silent, but maybe they are sitting with black people, and if they don't post, then they then they are disowned. And so I've seen so many in a sense of of, of people, um, particularly white people who have 
only supported this because they felt the pressure to. Yeah. And I believe that that takes away from the authenticity of truly loving a brother in Christ. I don't believe that a man, a white man or a white woman needs to read books to educate themselves on loving a black person. If you submit yourself to the rule and love of Christ and you allow him to change your heart, you can then love somebody in a manner without being educated in social justice issues. You can see a black man be murdered and then you can say in yourself, you can have a compassion and a heart for that person who was murdered without, I, I really believe that. I really believe that a change, the gospel is the only thing that can change a person from their racist behavior. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. It's not my like, and I, don't, I don't mean to cut you off, Jay, Go but ahead, like, like, like social media is a platform that's developing to, and into a, a, into almost this kind of like um, platform of uh, if of, of being valid or some type of if I don't know if I'm saying it right validity. Um, certain people feel very valid if they have to post something. Yeah. You don't have to post a hashtag. That that's not gonna make me love you any less. Uh, just from me knowing who you are in your heart, like that's enough. And if I don't know you. Well then, hey, I don't know you, and I would assume the best. You know, you know, we would like the scripture says, "Love hopes all things." So if love hopes all things, we hope that people have the best intentions, even if they're don't, if even if they're not posting hashtag BLM. You know what I mean? So, as a Christian believer, as a believer, we would hope that people display their love. It doesn't have to be by social media, but if they do, hey. Praise God. You know, I won't think any less of them. I would say if they if they feel that comfortable to post that, post it. If they don't, there's no lo love loss coming from a, a, a believing perspective. Now, you know, other than that, I don't know. But I, I think I don't see anything wrong with it. Kind of like online with what Bill was saying, like being that we are believers, we're 100 percent in there. Um, I would also like encourage believers to. Uh, just because you you identify as a Christian doesn't mean that you can't have conversations with people from other groups. Like you don't immediately write them off because they did use the hashtag, or maybe they, you know, they're mixed up or they're they're confused and they're they're angry or they're upset or you know they're they're posting things to try to counter something that someone else posts. I think that as believers, we want to try to be the most effective we can be in reaching people and and understanding the love that Christ has shown us, the forgiveness that He's displayed to us. Um, we need to be willing to to walk into situations, willing to extend that same forgiveness and and grace to other people, uh, regardless of what group they are. If it's the the Black Lives Matter group or the Breast Cancer Awareness group, whatever group, like I want to just I want to if I have the opportunity, they're in front of me. I want to establish a relationship, have a conversation, hopefully win them to Christ. Um, that's that's the end game. So uh, I mean, the thing I think of in my head is like Paul said, you know, I'm I'm being all things to all men. Like I'm trying to just reach people. I just want to be effective. And, and, and I think if we hold to our principles, we understand the word of God, we, we are absorbing it for ourselves, like Bill said, then we have something to give out to other people. And I think that, that needs to be uh, the call of the Christian is just allow God to speak to you, uh, decide what it is that, that he has called you to, so then you can be effective in that sphere of influence. Like not everyone needs to be the activist. Not everyone needs to be fitting this certain mold just because it's hot right now. Like what has God called you to as an individual Maybe it's to do music or maybe some write a poem or make a YouTube video. Whatever, what is it that God has called you to so that we can be effective as a body, as a, as as a, a complete, unit, yep. uh, body full of different members with different functions, uh, reaching people for, for with the message of hope in this time where people are just they're searched. Mm -hmm. I think um, I, yeah. I was going to say, um, yeah, it kind of goes back to kind of what I was talking about earlier, that it, it's all about really in your heart. Do you, do you really care? So the person... Now uh, that's that's posting um, BLM. It, it's it's. Do you really care? I remember because cause they think it's a fad. They think it's just it's whatever. Like you said, BLM BLM is um being trademarked. And I don't know if you guys remember, but um remember the ALS challenges. And you got uh, every October you have um, breast care um, breast cancer awareness. And it's like okay, this is 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 only at points. So every day during this whole 365 days out the year, 
do I care about ALS? Do I care about breast yeah. cancer? But do I only care about it in October where I can put my little pink? Do I only care about when um, BLM matters when uh, something happens, when it's a big major event? Because honestly, I don't see BLM on a daily basis. I only on see it when it happens, when, it's, when something happens. So the Christian and myself, I can say I care about all of it. I care about um, our black lives. I care about um, um, everybody's life because I, I love I love my brothers and I love um, people who uh, I, I want I want people to come to Christ. Uh, at the end of the day, that's my goal. I want to make disciples. Also, I love ministering to those who don't even know Christ. It, it's such a joy to see a face that never heard the gospel or heard the gospel but didn't understand it. And and we and we you know and then I see somebody with. Um, cancer and I hear the story I'm like dang and I really go into deep thought and I go into prayer about it uh all, all the time it's, it's not a random I mean it is a random time that I'll be like dang like cancer is out there and this is like on a Tuesday mm -hmm. you know it's not October it, so that's what it's about it's, it's and, that, and obviously that's the you know if, if they're gonna post BLM you know let it be a lifestyle. Post it all if you want. Let it be a lifestyle. Let it be genuine love like Christ us. He died for us. One of you guys. Every last one of us. And that's what it's about. And, and um, you know, will I die for my brother? Will I will I lay down my life for um, my brother or you know anybody and, and that's what it, that's what it's about because you know we only care when it happens and it don't happen to us at all. Oh, it's breaking up. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that thing going so slow. It got you sounding real special, man. Just, just just when you see the recording, you'll you'll figure it out, man. When you see the recording, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know what? On that note, brothers, I gotta take off because I gotta put the kids to sleep. But yes, keep sir, it going, yes, man. I wanna tune in. I wanna see it, man. I love you, brothers. Love man. you too, man. Love you, D. Love you too, Thanks brother. Hey, nice you. to meet you, man. You too. I'll be out there in Inglewood. Come check you out, Bill. Well, come holler at me, man. You come through, I, we'll hang out. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right, brothers. Love y'all, man. Keep him going. Keep it going. Right. Amen. All right, guys. All right, man. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm in that boat too, man. I'm, I'm uh, yeah, like eight yeah. times the kids and wife's putting them all down. So I'm going to be out too, fellas. Should we have a closing prayer, man, before we lose them yeah, all? Yeah. I think we should, Bill. I think we should. Right. Absolutely. It was a blessing, man. Um, it's a blessing to just, you know, not not even knowing everybody, man, just getting to come together and uh, chop it up, man. It's been good. Appreciate everything everybody had to share, man. And um, you guys sharing from the heart, man. And Jesus, man, love all you brothers. And uh, let's wrap it up with some prayers. Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. Thank you for uh, uh, just each brother that's on here. Thank you for Josh's heart, Lord, to just see this come together. And um, God, I pray that um, you would, in each of our hearts, Lord, uh, that you would continue to rule and reign in our hearts, Lord. That we would, we would know that there is no answer outside of you or apart from you. Yes, Lord. That we would only look to you, Lord. That we would only promote you as the answer. Yes, Lord. God, I pray that um, none of us would be used to divide. Uh, that God, we would love our, 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 we would love the black body of Christ. We love the white body of Christ. And yes, truly, Lord. the body of Christ is, is it encompasses every group every nation every tribe every tongue god give us vision that's that big that lord we would love each person god i pray you would fill our hearts with forgiveness each one of us the only reason we're not going to hell is because you forgave us in jesus name so lord rather than us being angry or 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 or, or vengeful i gotta pray you fill our hearts with just forgiveness for yes, those that may have yeah. wronged us god we, we pray for that officer um, Lord, he needs yes, you. He's still, he's still alive. There's still an opportunity for him to be saved. God, we pray for him. We pray that you would have your way. That would be your will. It would please you more to Lord. take him to heaven than, than to see him go to hell. Yes, and so, God, we pray you would intervene in his life. I pray that these would be the circumstances that you use to bring him to the end of himself. God, I pray yes. for the many that are hurting because of these things. That, God, there be people in their lives that would preach the gospel and they, they, would, look, they would look to you in their hurt where they can find true comfort, true peace, and true healing. 
And so, God, I pray that you would mobilize us as your church, uh, that we would be effective, that we would be sharing the gospel, Lord, that we would we would give the hope that we have found in you. And I pray, God, there'd be many that would come to know you and uh, those that have been pushed away that would be brought in. And so, Lord, use us for your glory. Help us not to get caught up in the side issues that don't matter. Help us to keep this about you in every way. Help us, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.